Hi, I'm Tim. He's Brian. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. We are the team with the theme and today, what is the theme, Brian? Patek Philippe. Excellent. Now, folks, the company spans the entire spectrum from simple watches to complications, dress watches to sports watches, but we decided to shelve the Nautilus and the Aquanaut for today and mm -hmm. reach deep into the complications catalog. Brian, let's start off. So, we can start off with that piece. So here we have a Patek Philippe 5961 Platinum. So the 5961P is, again, it's, it, it's effectively a 5960 with diamonds. Now, there are numerous iterations of the 5960. The watch is produced in, has been produced in platinum, it's been produced in rose gold, it has been produced in stainless steel. But the rarest and often probably most unknown variants are the precious gemstone pieces. So, we have a matte blue cobalt dial. We have a almost recessed baguette diamond bezel and you have baguette markers there. For me, the watch definitely does have a bling factor to it, but I wouldn't say that it's overly ostentatious. Overall, I think that many consumers and collectors sort of fall into the, they're into diamonds on men's watches or they're not into diamonds on men's and watches. And it is a passionate topic. <laughs> exactly. Like you thought the election was bad. These are fighting words here among watch collectors. Diamonds, gems generally on men's watches are controversial, but I feel like Patek Philippe has struck a chord in two ways. First, since about 2000, there's the platinum diamond between the lugs at six o'clock on the platinum uh, Patek Philippe. So you've got that top Vesselton diamond, also known as the platinum diamond, because it signals that you're looking at a platinum Patek. Now that's unobtrusive, and I would even say rather rich. It's well regarded. The other effective tactic that Patek has worked into an increasing number of its watches is the use of baguette diamond indices on men's watches. Mm -hmm. We saw it on the anniversary Nautilus, we saw it on the 5170P, and with the 5960 one, we really get a sense that this might be a trend. Brian, do you see us heading in that direction? So I think that the short answer is yes. I think that there's definitely a trend in male consumers adopting more precious metal pieces and particularly with precious gemstones. You also see it from brands like Rolex where some of their most comfortable and desirable pieces do feature gemstones. Particularly the Rainbow Daytona, I would say, is the most prevalent of that watch. Paddock, as you said, has been incorporating gemstones into their pieces for quite a while. You also see gemstones on Nautilus watches, and some of the most desirable and hardest to get Nautilus watches are those that feature gemstones. And I think that when you have a product line such as the Nautilus where they feature gemstones, and those being the hardest, rarest, and most desirable pieces, that then trickles down to the rest of the line and increases desirability for gemstone pieces where customers may not have been looking before. I think that it takes a, what normally is a, let's call it somewhat casual dress watch and definitely gives it a bigger bling factor and pop factor. We changed the watch. This is not the factory strap. For many of the watches on the table you're gonna see, we ordered a custom Jean Rousseau strap for the watch with this bright shiny blue. And to me, this actually plays better to the watch itself. It's something that if you go, if you ever have the opportunity to go to the Geneva Salon or any of their salons, Paddock will change the stock straps to custom colored straps that really highlight the watch itself. And to me, this is a strap that really highlights the watch better than, than the factory strap that came with it originally. And I think just plays up the overall pop factor of the watch better. Yeah, not only more desirability, diamonds with Patek Philippe watches, but more acceptability when men wear Patek Philippe watches with diamonds. It used to be when you thought of Patek Philippe and diamonds, you thought of the ladies 24 immediately. I think Patek has done a good job of sort of democratizing diamonds so men can wear them without feeling self-conscious, or at least to the extent that you won't feel self-conscious wearing a five to six figure watch. Mm -hmm. Now there is more to say here. If you look closely, you can see that the baguette gems that are set into the bezel are effectively an invisible setting. Mm -hmm. Whereas conventional setting will feature little pincers, clasps at the four corners of the individual gems. Here you only have the outboard and inboard corners of the bezel. So it is a very clean fitting. Now the watch itself, we should mention is a annual calendar flyback chronograph. So if you were wondering about me actuating the chronograph out of sequence before, no harm, no foul. It's a flyback. It was designed that way. There's a power reserve indicator up at 12 o'clock. You could easily miss it. 
up to 55 hours of power reserve, and then my favorite, an annual calendar with apertures rather than with a radial indicator. Now you can also see there's a fascinating scale at the bottom of the dial that's known as the bullseye. It's not as overt as it was on the original 2006 5960, but it's still there. It's a mono counter for hours and minutes. And what it basically does is it keeps the symmetry of the dial intact. And there's a little aperture underneath so you know when not to actuate the system. You can see we're in the transition from day to night. That is when you don't want to use the pushers on the case flank to change the annual calendar. Now flip it all over. By the way, I should also mention they went all out with the gem setting, including the buckle itself. But it's the movement that really sets this one apart as this 28520 movement came out in 2006 on the Nautilus Chrono and the 5960, it was Patek's first ever automatic in-house chronograph. And it's amazing to think that as late as 2006, Patek didn't have that, but this is an important plank owner in Patek Leap history. Gyromax, free sprung, silicon hairspring, six position adjustment, guaranteed minus three plus two seconds per day from the factory or better. It is a vertical clutch column wheel chronograph. And that's an important thing because with the vertical clutch, you get the ability to run the seconds hand full time. You'll note that if you actually stop the seconds hand, it's a rather still dial as there's no running seconds. But thanks to the vertical clutch, you can simply run the chronograph continuously and have your seconds, your minutes, and your hours at center. Also, if you do want to synchronize it to the second, it doesn't have hacking seconds, but you can use the flyback function to effectively hack and zero reset. So this watch is all sorts of fun. 40.5 millimeters in platinum. It is very hefty on the wrist, though not overly so. The case is in elegant shape. And I have to say, all things considered, there's a wonderful aesthetic balance to this one. There's also one quality, besides not being sports watches, that all these watches have in common. And we'll discuss that at the end. Let me do a quick wrist shot, because frankly, for once, I'm not wearing my Zin. I figured, while the election is still up in the air, I'm going to wear this American watch in the spirit of bipartisanship. It's a Devon Tread 1 Group 63. It's named after a Middle Eastern car club out of the UAE, and it's the Devon Tread 1, which means it is a digital jumping hours, minute, and seconds watch. The timepiece has a super quartz thermal compensated quartz circuit and then four motors that drive four belts on the dial. And every time you wake it up, it's a little piece of theater. And to my experience, it's very accurate as it's running bang on with not even a second of deviation in the last week. So a lot of fun there. Brian, let's see what you got. I think I'm wearing the same watch that I wore when we filmed the last show. 5065A, 38 millimeter stainless steel Aquanaut from the prior generation of Aquanauts. I have it on a gray Luce strap. And again, probably the watch that I am wearing the most these days. It's a lot of fun, and it's about as different from the Devon as you can possibly get. And by the way, I am sort of uh, still in the show here with the constant seconds against my mic. I apologize, but it's just too much fun to play with this thing. It's more of a toy than a watch. I'll be totally honest there. Okay, let's do the 5370P, because this is a watch that came out in 2015. And in many regards, it might have been the best manual wind Patek Philippe complication of the 2010s. 41 millimeters in platinum, this one pulls out all the stops. As you have a platinum case, you've got that diamond between the lugs, you've got these lovely relieved and scalloped lug hollows and case flank, then you have these white gold cabochon at the end. The dial is black vitreous enamel, so black enamel grand faux with white gold brigade numerals, a very special watch. It is a split second chronograph with a coaxial retropont trigger, the timepiece, double column wheel, 65 hour power reserve. It features, yes, hacking or stop seconds. We now have that with caliber 29535. The watch is also beautifully built internally as the movement is stacked and exhibits depth in a way that used to be the monopoly of movements from a Longo Unzona. Although the style is very distinct relative to the datagraph and its caliber 951, the 29535 easily holds its own. The steel components of the chronograph beveled on their sides, satin on their top, Cote de Genève across the brass parts. Note the extraordinary lateral clutch fully jeweled and the black polished primary column wheel. There is a secondary column wheel and there's also a pincer system that operates at center in conjunction with that secondary column wheel. Underneath it all, there's a separate chronograph bridge for the minutes and it's an instantaneous minute jumper. 
overcoil hairspring, six position adjustment, same precision tolerances that I mentioned with the 5961. This timepiece is a little bit thinner, both because it is less complicated in an absolute sense and because it is a manual wind. The beauty of a manual wind watch is that in general, all else equal, it can be thinner and you can see the entirety of the case back. Now the watch is gorgeous. The dial has a high level of contrast thanks to the loom inside the leaf hands for the hours and minutes, but the combination of black enamel with white gold numerals really sets this watch apart, and that's before you even get into the case and the mechanics. Brian, was this a landmark watch for Patek? I couldn't agree more. I think that this is probably one of the finest modern era Pateks that has been produced to date. 41 millimeters in size, right out of the gate. It's a modern size and for those that are looking for something to wear a little bit larger. Black enamel is extremely difficult to produce, generally reserved only for their highest level of complications. You see it on the 5374 as well as the 5316, which are perpetual calendar minute repeaters. As you mentioned, you've got luminescence hands there, which shows you that Paddock meant for this watch to possibly be worn as a daily wear. And again, I think that the watch itself is exceptional with the Breguet numerals. I'm a huge fan. The modern case, the proportions, just everything was spot on. We changed the strap. Uh, again, another custom made Jean Rousseau strap. We wanted to have a little bit more fun with this. I had seen an orange strap on the watch before and I thought it was just gangbusters awesome. Uh, traditionally, the watch comes on a black strap, which definitely makes the watch a little bit more formal, but I think having this pop of color makes the watch a little bit more casual and sporty and presents it in a different light. The other nice thing about these Jean Rousseau straps is that like the original Patek Philippe, they're alligator on both sides and they feature pull tab spring bars. So I just demonstrated how I took the strap off the case without a tool. That's one of the advantages of these straps. The other nice thing about these straps is that you can enliven the watch in a way that perhaps the factory itself never envisioned. So I really enjoy that factor. The other thing too is that this watch was probably the most unanimously welcomed Patek Philippe release of the last 10 years. Every time Patek launches a new watch, there is tremendous contentious cynicism, anger, um, inflamed opinions on both sides. Does it sound familiar, people? Have we, have, are we not quite past this? Is it too soon? But I will say this, opinions are always inflamed and red hot when Patek comes out with a new watch. Nobody lambasted this design when it came out in 2015. All right, a little bit more controversial, but only <laughs> because it's so grand. This is a big piece. Brian, tell us about it. So here we have the Patek Philippe reference 5204. So this is Patek Philippe's 5204 slash 1R. So this is Patek Philippe's in-house perpetual calendar chronograph split second chrono. The watch is the most, not necessarily, I wouldn't say the most recent version. Well, it is the most recent version of the watch. The watch has been produced both in platinum and a white dial, and platinum and a black dial on a strap, as well as rose gold with a white dial on a strap. It's the only iteration of the watch that comes factory on a bracelet. The prior version of this watch was the 5004, which is again regarded as one of the best Patek Philippe watches ever made. It featured the Perpetual calendar, chronograph, split second, but a Lamagna movement. So as I had said, this version is in-house. For me, rose gold with black dial is just a magical combination. The watch is exceptional on a bracelet. I think it gives it, honestly, slightly better wearability given the way that the shape of the case is constructed and how it sits a little bit high sometimes when it's on a strap. But on a bracelet, the form and the fit is just that much better. It's a watch that I think often goes unnoticed in Paddock's overall catalog. It's a watch that on the secondary market trades at a discount to retail and are available at really competitive prices. And when I look and I see the secondary market value of some of the other Paddocks that are in their line and where they're trading relative to things like this, I honestly just think it makes no sense. Now it's the same base movement as the 5370 we just saw, but it adds the complication of a perpetual calendar. Brian was right to mention the fit advantages of a bracelet. Now normally we think of watches on straps as being easier to wear, but because of the flexibility of the bracelet, both because it pulls straight down so easily and because of the small cross section of the individual links, it winds up being very, very flexible. So this watch, which is about 41 millimeters, wears 
immensely better than if it were, for example, on a rather thick and stiff strap. And you can really see that to advantage. There is no flexibility in the strap until it breaks in. The other thing that's nice about this watch is that unlike the 5004 that uh, Brian mentioned, this is a much more durable timepiece. The 5004, everyone acknowledges it, came out a little bit undercooked back in the mid-90s and took a long time to correct all of those defects, whereas this watch came out, and this model that you see right here is about three years old in terms of the time it's been on the market, and it was right from the beginning. It's the same 65-hour lateral clutch, column wheel movement in the 5370, and for that matter, in the 5170s, but the complexity of it enhanced by both the split second mechanism, and I'm doing my best, it's tough when a watch is on a bracelet, but by the split second mechanism and then on the dial side, the perpetual calendar, it is a lot of fun to wear it. And you'll note this dial is not just a dial of loomed hands, but all the indices. And that's what unites all of the watches we're discussing today. Yes, they're dress watches. Yes, they're all precious metal, but they're all loomed. Every single one of these watches designed to be read in the dark. And not just lip service, this is a fully loomed dial that'll rival, for example, an Omega Aquaterra. It's a good looking watch day or night. And the richness of the rose gold in what was originally an application piece adds grandeur to this model. And Brian also mentioned earlier, and it's an important point, that Patek thought of everything featuring end links on the bracelet that is designed to bypass and allow you to immediately access the pusher correctors for the calendar. So in spite of the fact that they would ordinarily be covered by the bracelet ends, here there's a bypass to get straight to the pusher. And it is a truly spectacular case. If you look, for example, at the 5961, you can see the case is stamped as one piece. It's all integral. Everything came together as one block out of the machine. Whereas with the 5204, you can see that there is a separate profile. The lugs were built as individual components and then welded on. And that sharp break between the lug and the case is indicative of a watch that is handmade inside and out, and not just hand polished, but actually hand assembled with evidence of the weld removed after welding. So this is a truly spectacular watch and a rare privilege, a timepiece that frankly doesn't draw the same looks and stares as even a steel Nautilus, but connoisseurs are gonna know what this is. That's a really fun piece. And the case itself, it has a lot of nuance to it. If you look closely, you can also see there's a nice step where the bezel moves proud of the case, and then the bezel itself is concave in profile. So Patek put a lot of thought into this watch. We were talking yesterday too, when, you know, uh, as, as you'd mentioned that it doesn't get the same level of stairs as a call it stainless steel Nautilus. You know, take a 5271 Rose, which is effectively the same watch, but without the split second functionality. And that watch is trading on the secondary market for even far, le for far less in price than a Nautilus Chrono. And that's a perpetual Chrono. So I think that there's watches that are on the market right now that offer considerable value for what they are and how rare they are. And these are the types of watches that when you fast forward five, 10 years, will be the watches that collectors talk about and say, hey, remember when these watches were this? and I could have gotten it for this. Uh, and uh, because they're just that good and they're just that scarce. Yeah, I remember there was a time when a pre-owned 5711 was a watch that watch you want back in the day, bought for less than retail used and sold in the low 20s. So markets move very quickly as perceptions shift, but more often than not, it's not the obvious one to spot. It's not the steel sports watch that you wish you bought down the line. It's gonna be a timepiece that is rare, complicated, and overlooked for a lot of its life. So this is a timepiece that I have to say was a little bit controversial when mm -hmm. it came out, but I love it. I loved it then, I love it now. There are no neutral opinions on the Patek Philippe 5320G. So tell me a little bit about this, because I, I know you have a close link to the Patek brand and you have a lot of insight into this model. So, you know, when the watch came out, they were definitely going for that nouveau vintage look and feel. You've got this beautiful bright cream dial, you've got highly luminescent Arabic numerals, these white gold blackened syringe hands. First and foremost, I'm a sucker for anything with a syringe hand. So I was immediately drawn to the watch. Coming in at 40 millimeters, the case size was a modern case size. This was Patek Philippe's way of launching a watch for the younger modern collector. They were moving away from that smaller, more traditional perpetual calendar that you saw with the 5140, and they were moving into the modern era. I would say, Across the board, folks, in my opinion, loved this watch. 
the only nuance where if, if they had to pick apart something was the stamped case. And for me, honestly, it's not a drawback. I think that the case itself is beautiful. It's modern. I'm a fan of the way that they step the lugs. And ultimately, this watch was perfectly executed. Again, we switched the strap. This is a custom-made genre so strap with a almost distressed water-resistant cobalt blue crocodile, which I think really plays to the, the blue of the moon phase and gives the watch a whole different level of character. It's true. It's almost like a new book texture, the mm -hmm. strap itself. It's very velvety. The watch is fascinating because it's a 40 millimeter Patek dress watch, which puts it on the larger side for something that's not really a high complication or a compound complication. Now the stamped case, in my opinion, gets a total pass because it's beautiful. There's the pagoda-like stacking of the case flank and the bezel. And then there's the specific reference to the 1940s, reference 2405, which featured this triple tiered lug profile and it's bang on. As soon as you Google 2405, you'll see the resemblance. It's masterful, it's grand, it's distinctive of this model and this model alone as Patek has not bled it out over the rest of the model line, so it's remained exclusive. Now, the dial of the watch is fascinating because although many people cite the Patek Fleet 1526 perpetual calendar of 1942, this dial specifically appears to derive from the piece unique stainless steel reference 1591 perpetual calendar of 1944. And you can see that in the syringe hands, the Arabic numerals, and significantly compared to the 15. 26, the center seconds hand. You have tremendous contrast on this dial because it has a lovely cream lacquered base and then warm tones for the filling of the numerals. The numerals themselves stand proud of the dial, three-dimensional, applique, blackened for high contrast, and the same is true of the syringe hands. This is an awesome execution of vintage design channeled through modern fit, finish, and materials. When you throw it on the wrist, the timepiece looks good and feels good. Uh, as you can see, it's relatively short across the wrist. So like the 5204, it wears better than you expect for a 40 or a 40 plus millimeter watch. It's also thin and it's a rare center rotor automatic Patek Fleet perpetual calendar. So when you flip it over, you can see it's the caliber 324 on the reverse side. But the watch is absolutely gorgeous primarily because of what you see on the dial side. It's the bezel, it's the case, it's the hands, it's the numerals, it's the dial, it's the lugs, it's all of that. And the fact that this watch has remained very rare. Given the years since its launch, I would have expected to see more than the one or two of those we see per year. Yeah, I mean, I think that, again, Paddock makes a large collection of watches and they come out with quite a few novelties each year. And some, you know, most of them only last short model runs. Some last a bit, a little bit longer than others. But I don't believe that this watch, they ever intended it to simply be a larger core model, similar to the 5327s, where those were the truly next generation of the 5140. They're almost gentlemen's perpetual. This is a standalone watch. And again, for me, I think exactly the direction that the brand needed to go in. And we talk a lot about a lot of other brands, and I, and I know that you've mentioned this before, and I think it, it is 100% true, is that Patek Philippe's standard of excellence has been going on for so long that the brand itself is almost taken for granted at this point, because there's really no other brand that produces the gamut of watches, everything from ladies' dress to ladies complication to men's ultra high complication to men's sport in such a diverse way while always having new and interesting products come out and also producing to the highest level of quality there's there's nobody else that does it nearly to their level uh, it's true i mean we talk about brands that are that are popular right now like fp Jorn, for example you know, FP Jorn maintains a high level of demand relative to its production because it makes 900 watches a year. It's not like we see overflowing volumes of Patek Philippe at dealers and on the market, in spite of the fact that Patek makes tens of thousands of watches. So it's an impressive balancing act that they have the same brand equity and notoriety that Jorn has, albeit with industrial scale production. And they don't cheapen their watches, mm -hmm. which I appreciate. Uh, even when they have something like a basic Nautilus that hasn't at face value changed since 2006, in that period it's gained a new movement, it's gained a silicon hairspring, it's gained ceramic pin snaps in the bracelets. So 
they're very good at refining. And every once in a while, they make a quantum leap. And in style, that's exactly what the 5320G is. And I'll also say this. Although that watch is priced four lower, I probably see five or six 5370Ps for every 5320G. So that perpetual calendar with the cream dial you just saw, guys, it is not going to last. Keep I think that, that in mind. That means that we're buying too many 5370Ps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're selling them too. That's a good watch to have. And frankly, I prefer the black dial from the new blue one that just came out. Uh, first, because I think the black's more intense visually. Second, because I feel like blue's kind of been done. I don't think we need a blue dial version of everything. And sometimes it's nice to revert to what was considered to be the premium dial style, you know, back in the 90s and the 2000s when a black dial watch really meant something in the catalog. All right, Brian, if people want to reach us, how do they do it? So you can reach out to Tim at thewatchbox.com. You can reach out to, I think it's social at thewatchbox.com. You can reach out to me directly on Instagram, Brian Gothenberg, or you can reach out to me directly at brian at thewatchbox.com. And because we need to make this more complicated, purchase and pricing questions to Team Also at The Watchbox are guaranteed to get to the sales team. Tim at thewatchbox.com is a waterfall. You're taking your chances. <laughs> All right, guys. Time out, Tim out, Brian out, and thanks for logging on.